Support for The Common comes from the law firm of Davis Malm. Big or small, every case gets their full attention and most creative thinking. Their litigators are committed to resolving disputes in and out of the courtroom. Learn more at davismalm.com. Support for this podcast comes from MathWorks, a company accelerating the pace of engineering and science. Stick around until the end of this episode for a special segment about how companies like Nuvera Fuel Cells use MathWorks software to design engineered systems powering the clean energy transition. WBUR Podcasts, Boston. I'm Daryl C. Murphy, and you're listening to The Common. Today, September 12th, marks the 50th anniversary of the first day of the school year that began Boston's infamous busing era. And why we were in school that was throwing glass at black people and little kids. If the parents just stay out of it all, let the kids work it out for themselves, it'll be all right. A federal court order by Judge W. Arthur Garrity mandated that both black and white students be bused to schools outside of their neighborhoods. What followed was a series of protests and riots that put a spotlight on the deep racism in the city. But while this moment is a major flashpoint in the city's history, it is not the whole story. Busing was the culmination of a years-long fight going back more than a decade between a Black community that wanted a better education for its children and a white community resistant to change. Boston journalist, lecturer, historian, and friend of the show, Dart Adams, knows a thing or two about this history, and he's going to talk to us about it today. Dar Adams, welcome back to The Common. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yes, indeed. So, Dart, busing is a pivotal moment in Boston's history, but was part of a larger movement before that, right? And part of that movement was something called the Freedom Stay Out. It was a boycott of Boston public schools that was uh, meant to call out the inequality between black and white students mm-hmm. in the public school system. Um, can you tell us more about Freedom Stay Out? Okay, so what happened was uh, it was a joint effort between the NAACP and uh, community organizers. The leaders of the Freedom Stay Out movement were Reverend James Breeden and Noel A. Day, who came to Boston by way of New York, and be- he became a social worker, and he became an a advocate for youth. And he worked in this place called the St. Mark Social Center, which mm-hmm. was in Roxbury. And they saw all the issues happening with um, the black students in the Boston public school system. Uh, one of the weird, crazy things that people don't really talk about n- enough is that between 1950 and 1970, Boston's black population ballooned. That meant that we had this influx of black students in the Boston public school system at entry points, talking about from kindergarten all the way up to high school. And it kind of overwhelmed the Boston public school system. And what ends up happening is they're put into schools where, you know, the black and Latino population existed, which was mostly the South End, Lower Roxbury, Roxbury. And at the time, they called it North Dorchester. And it turns out that those schools were usually built in either the late 1800s and the newest one was built in 1937. And they were not in good shape. Mm -hmm. So what ends up happening is students are going to school where... Toilets don't have seats. There aren't enough books. They don't have enough staff to deal with them. There's almost no black staff to directly deal with the issues of the students. And that was a glaring issue, a massive issue, because what happens is you have parents who are like, what is going on at my child's school? Mm -hmm. Why are they receiving this inadequate education. So between 1963 and 1964, uh, it had come to a head and the clergy and community organizers and parents all agreed that we have to do something. NAACP took charge and they went to the uh, Boston School Committee and said that our students are not getting as good an education 
as white students are in the Boston public school system for these reasons. And also, when you look at these schools that are having the issue, they're overwhelmingly populated by black students. Any school that is predominantly Negro in Boston is an inadequate school. But Mrs. Johnson, the superintendent of schools, has stated as his policy that a racially imbalanced school is not educationally harmful. Well, <laughs> Mrs. Hicks, may, uh, Madam Chairman, may I say this? Superintendent Orenberger and yourself and other committee members do not have children in a racially imbalanced school. So you do not know what the effect is on our children. <laughs> So now take us to the Freedom Stay Out mm-hmm. and the Freedom Schools. Okay. I believe June 1963 was the first Freedom Stay Out Day. Uh, when they did it, a certain amount of students stayed out. And from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m., they had what they called Freedom School. They had a completely different curriculum than the Boston Public School System had. And they also had this thing called reciprocal integration in place. They bust in white students and they, uh, and some of these, these students were from the suburbs. Yes, yeah, some of those students were from the suburbs, the white students especially. What this was was they realized if we're going to take white students and bring them to the black neighborhood and have them around mostly black students, we have to address the elephant in the room. Mm-hmm. And we have to have these students talk to each other because they have these stereotypes and these ideas of each other that are far from the truth. So let's have them have an open dialogue. Because if we don't, we're doing a disservice to the white students and the black students. And also, we're going to teach the black students things that are going to empower them and inform them and have pride in themselves. So reciprocal integration was a way to have the students have an open dialogue about the realities of their lives and how they view each other. And then have have mediators, adults in between, help bridge the gap. So what ends up happening is that we go back to the Boston School Committee. And they're kind of shown up. So they have to now take action. And one of the things that they do, there was a program called uh, Project Exodus. If they didn't address the issues, the inequity between black and white students, one of the ideas they had was to bus some black students to suburban schools or schools just outside of where they lived that were better and could better provide for them in terms of education, had better facilities, books, you know, funding. Busing before the busing that we've come to understand from the 1970s. Yes, because Project Exodus later gives way to the METCO system. Yep. And then later we get busing as the ruling comes down in 1974. Mm -hmm. And again, that ends up becoming one, I'd say, the defining thing about Boston in the last 50 years. The reaction to the busing movement. So what happened to the Freedom Schools in Boston after those two uh, boycott days? You had places that no longer exist, like the St. Mark's Social Center. You had Freedom House, which was in the, on the Roxbury Dorchester line. You had all these different community centers. So these type of things were happening there Mm -hmm. already. And there are about maybe 10 to 12 of those kind of programs back in um, this thing called the USES, United South End Settlements. So you had all these different houses and you also had them in Roxbury and Dorchester. And they were places where black and Latino youth went also like the boys and girls clubs, the YWCA. They were led by somebody. And a lot of times the idea of what they were doing at the uh, Freedom School was being imp- implemented at these, at these centers or maybe at a church somewhere. And they had a program for that. So the idea of the Freedom Schools and what they were doing the Freedom Schools in 63 and 64 didn't die. It carried on to the late 60s into the 70s because we get to the um, civil rights era. Then we get to the black power movement, the counterculture era. So all these ideas of black empowerment and I'm black and proud, black is beautiful. This is when this starts. Mm. So what I'm saying is the Freedom Schools didn't just happen in 63, 64, and then the spirit of it dies because energy never dies. It just changes form. Right, right. Well, thank you for that. I want to take a quick break. But when we get back, I want to talk about busing and what it was like here and across the country. And what are the lingering impacts of that here in the city?
Support for this podcast comes from the Atlantic Festival. On September 19th and 20th in Washington, D.C., connect with other curious people and think deeply about the issues that matter most. Hear from Supreme Court Justice Katanji Brown Jackson, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, writer and actor Anna Devere Smith, and dozens of elected officials, authors, climate scientists, healthcare professionals, tech giants, and CEOs. In person tickets and virtual passes are available now at theatlanticfestival.com. Support for this podcast comes from MathWorks, the leading developer of mathematical computing software that accelerates innovation by allowing companies to test technology virtually. They're able to understand how that system's going to work before they start to begin building hardware systems. Stick around until the end of this episode for a special segment about how model-based design is helping engineers, scientists, and academics solve today's energy challenges. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty, host of On Point. At a time when the world is more complex than ever, On Point's daily deep-dive conversation takes the time to make the world more intelligible. From the state of democracy to how artificial intelligence is transforming the way we live and work to the wonders of the natural world. One topic each day, one rich and nuanced exploration. That's On Point from WBUR. Be sure to follow us right here in your podcast feed. Our kids, by now you know that they won't go Cause we won't send them The time is getting near For a constitutional amendment The bus will never work But some big jerk made a decision This man, I really think and we're back with Dart Adams. All right, so we're talking about busing. Mm -hmm. And you started us off with the movement that preceded the busing decision in 1974. Yes. Which is what a lot of people think about when we talk about busing in Boston. But I want to talk about why 1974 stood out so much and drew such a visceral reaction from members of the Boston community, particularly the white members of the Boston Mm -hmm. community? Well, they'd been fighting for a decade at least by the time the ruling came down because they did not want to change their life, their community, or any aspect of their existence, as it were. The way they felt was... This is our community. This is our neighborhood. We don't want it changed. We don't want it tarnished. And when the ruling comes down, their reaction was immediate and should have been expected. Mm -hmm. And they let everyone know immediately they were not happy with the decision to have their children be bused to black neighborhoods and to have black children bust into their neighborhoods. I wouldn't care if they were green or purple with the idea of putting my kid on a bus when I have a school right across the street from where they should go. And I just want to paint the picture for anyone listening who may not be aware. This 1974 busing decision is where you get a lot of the ugly photos that come (laughs) out of Boston. I mean, Mm -hmm. there's stories of people throwing rocks at school buses with kids in them. Of course, there is the famous photo of a black man who is about to be assaulted with a flag. Mm -hmm. It it was a pretty rough time for Boston. Yes. And so, you know, when we talk about the 1974 busing decision and the reaction that it got, we're talking about a a time where the city was pretty much a powder keg. Like, was that exceptional? For Boston. So the big issue, too, is that Boston's PR <laughs> yeah. is that we're the cradle of liberty. You know, we're progressive. We're a city that's smart. We're educated, you know. And when that ruling came down, the veneer came off. You know, <laughs> yeah. 
another thing that Boston revealed, not only the racism, but there's a class aspect to this. Oh. Because these white kids who were being bused from Charlestown or South Boston, they they weren't wealthy kids. No. Look, when most people think of busing, they think of black students being brought into white neighborhoods yeah. and rocks being thrown and all this stuff happening. My experience with busing, my first year in the Boston public school system was 7980. Mm-hmm. Uh, my experience with busing was that white kids from Charlestown and South Boston were brought into the South End, Lower Roxbury and Roxbury. They would get off the bus. They would try to say the words that they were told to say by their parents, their uncles, their aunts, and their cousins. They got beat up, and then they never said it again, and then we we got to be friends. So the weird thing about that is that I discovered that the kids that were getting off that bus were just as poor Mm -hmm. as we were. We're in the same situation in the inner city only with white faces, this was their first interaction with kids that weren't white. And they learned a lot about life. A lot of that footage that we see Mm -hmm. um, during the 70s where we see the violence, was that all throughout the city? It was usually isolated to places like Charlestown, South Boston, Maybe East Boston. Uh, But the thing is that there was a visceral reaction to the busing ruling. However, Boston is not the only place that that reaction occurred. There was a very (laughs) heated reaction in parts of New York when they were busing black students in. The thing is that it's a defining characteristic of Boston. Mm. And why, again, because Boston gave the image that We're above this. We're better than this. We're a liberal city. We believe in freedom. We believe in equality. So that's why that has been one of the sticking points with people's idea of Boston, because Boston always professed to be different. Now, that's a snapshot of busing in the 1970s. What's the legacy of that today? How do we see it? So in 2021, they got rid of this system where you got to advance classes by fourth grade. So you had fourth, fifth, sixth advance, and then you took a test, the ISEE, to get into exam schools. Okay, what I'm getting at is that back in those days, white parents would only keep their children in the Boston public school system with the hope that their children were on track to enter advanced classes. When they discovered that their child was not selected for advanced classes by fourth grade, they yanked their children from the Boston public schools and put them into parochial schools, private schools, or Catholic schools. Hmm. So what happens is, as I'm growing up from kindergarten to first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, I realized that by the time I'm in fifth grade going into sixth grade, the only white kids still left in the Boston public school system were kids that were either going to advanced classes or kids that their parents didn't have a choice. Mm. They didn't have an alternative. That's the legacy of busing. White people pulled their children out of the Boston public school system. You could see it happening in the early to mid 80s already. Mm. But by the time we get to, let's say, 87, 88, it's almost completely done. So by the time I graduated from high school in 1995, it was rare to see a white kid in the Boston public school system. However, if you watched a film or a movie or a TV show, they'd have you thinking that the Boston public school system was full of white students. And we would watch those movies and laugh. Segregation by a different mechanism. Absolutely. From your perspective, where Mm -hmm. you're sitting, what type of inequalities still exist in the Boston public school system today? The Boston public school systems are dealing with a lot of issues. We've seen a decline in black students going to Boston public schools due to the issues with the schools. So it's the same issues now. It's just it's very different because... You have so many more things you can do in terms of education, so many more places you could go. People saw that there were serious issues with the Boston public school system, Mm -hmm. and they were like, we have to come up with a way to give our children a better education, better structure, better facilities. And everybody arrived at their answer. So the inequalities still exist here in Boston public schools. When you think about this history and everything that surrounded it, 
yeah, do you think it was worth it? So I went to all neighborhood schools. The schools I went to at first, a lot of them were built in the 70s. And the reason they were built is because a lot of people protested in the 60s about the schools, about the facilities and all these other things. But the education I got in those schools was vastly different than the previous generation because those schools that were built in the 70s had staffs that were black and Latino. We had murals depicting our lives and cultures. We had programs in place during holidays that celebrated us. So my experience growing up was varied and I learned about so many cultures and it was very worth it for me. We were coming out of the civil rights era. We were coming out of busing. We were coming out of all these other things. So we needed to do more things for the young people of Boston to show them that, you know, representation matters. This is something that we know now, right? So was it worth it? Absolutely, because we have to make things better for the youth. So if we want to improve our situation, then absolutely, yes, it was worth it. Did we get there? No, but here's the thing. The struggle is ongoing. The fight is ongoing. If you want equity, if you want equality, if you want better things for your children and future generations, that's a fight you're going to have to be on until the day you interned in earth or cremated. And then it's going to be continued by your children. Understood. Dart, as always, it's a pleasure, man. Thank you for everything and coming through to talk to us about it. We really appreciate you. Hey, it's what I'm here for. Thank you. If you want to learn more about the history of busing in Boston, you can head to WBUR.org and check out the series Busing's Legacy in Boston 50 Years Later, which was done in collaboration with The Emancipator. There, you'll find Dart's contribution, The Beautiful Vision of Boston's Freedom Schools. And that's our show for today. Thank you so much for listening to The Common. The show is produced by Franny Monahan. It's mixed by Emily Jankowski and Paul Vikas, And it's edited by Samantha Joshi and Ben Brock Johnson. And our theme music is Me by Hisu. And from the newsroom of WBUR, I'm your host, Daryl C. Murphy. I'll talk to you soon. Support for this podcast comes from MathWorks, accelerating the pace of discovery, innovation, development, and learning in engineering and science. Listen on for a story of how one company is using MathWorks software to help the planet. The transportation sector is one of the largest contributors of greenhouse gases, and a lot of that is for maritime transport. Yeah, maritime transport creates a huge amount of carbon dioxide, about um, 900 million tons annually. That's Gus Block, Corporate Development Director at Nuvera Fuel Cells, who explains that 90% of all foreign goods are transported through ports and container ships, most of which run on diesel. But Nuvera is working on a way to electrify this system through hydrogen fuel cells. Hydrogen can make all the difference between being able to electrify those vessels or not. Cargo ships often travel far distances. Well, sometimes they're crossing oceans, right? And hydrogen, the lightest element on the periodic table, is uniquely suited to help power the ship's long journeys. Fuel cells can take advantage of hydrogen's properties, being something that is quickly refueled, something you can carry on board a vehicle and be used in places where battery electrification is impractical for one reason or another. One reason, batteries can be really heavy. Another, batteries can take a long time to charge. That may be possible for harbor craft or for ferries, for instance, but for a long haul shipping, it's quite a different story. And what hydrogen gets you is the ability to carry much more energy on board than you would otherwise with batteries. And in addition to powering cargo ships, hydrogen fuel cell technology can be used to power electric trucks, heavy equipment, and also passenger cars. So, how do hydrogen fuel cells work? A fuel cell is an electrochemical device. Each individual cell in the stack consists of a membrane that separates hydrogen on one side and air on the other. And, as Nuvera chief engineer Pierre-Francois K explains, the hydrogen arrives at the membrane, 
breaks down into protons and electrons, generating power for a motor, all without the need to burn fossil fuels. In fact, they produce no exhaust other than heat and water. But implementation of this technology is no easy feat, with several challenges to overcome. One of our main challenges that we face is uh, hydration management. The membrane needs to be hydrated to be permeable to protons, but too much water can cause flooding and the fuel cell will not operate properly. So with model-based design using uh, MATLAB and Simulink, we created a model of the fuel cell and that allowed us to simulate our water management controls uh, in a variety of ambient conditions. Model-based design. I needed to check with someone from MathWorks, the creator of MATLAB and Simulink, to fully understand what's happening. Well, companies like Nuvera, who are using MATLAB and Simulink, are using it to model and simulate a complex engineered system. For Nuvera, it's a chemical reaction involving hydrogen as a fuel, which then is combined with air to form an electric current and water. That's Tony Lennon, the Simscape marketing manager at MathWorks, who explains that model-based design allows Nuvera to virtually simulate how the hydrogen fuel cell will operate in real time and to tackle challenges like hydration management virtually before using physical components. Not using model-based design means that you're going to be out there testing on real hardware. You run the risk of damaging hardware or not thoroughly testing all the operating envelope that the real equipment's going to see. And operating real hardware can take a lot of time. Pierre-Francois K. again. There's a huge advantage to simulate all of these conditions in a virtual environment instead of building systems physically, because those are expensive, and every time we need to change a piece of hardware, it takes time. Saving this time can mean more innovation and, in the case of Nuvera, more fuel cells to power the clean energy transition. To learn more about MathWorks and Nuvera, and for more stories, check out wbur.org slash MathWorks. Thank you.